Dr. Wasim Ahmed. I'm a graduate of Sin Medical College, class 1988, and today I'm going to talk about pulmonary hypertension. Normal pulmonary pressure, systolic blood pressure is 20 to 30, and diastolic is 5 to 15, and mean arterial blood pressure is 14 to 20. This mean arterial blood pressure was derived from about 12,000 volunteers from 14 seven different studies conducted in 13 different countries. By definition, pulmonary arterial hypertension means that mean pulmonary arterial pressure is 25 or above at rest with normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of 15 and less and a lesion localized to pulmonary arteriole. Updated clinical classification of pulmonary hypertension, this is derived from Fifth World Symposium on Pulmonary Hypertension held in France in 2013. And they divided pulmonary hypertension into five WHO groups. The changes that they have made, they moved from schistosomiasis from group five now to group one. And the group one is divided in, further subdivided into pulmonary arterial hypertension or primary pulmonary hypertension, which is idiopathic and hereditary, associated with connective tissue diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, mixed connective tissue disease, scleroderma SLE, congenital systemic to pulmonary shunts, portal hypertension, HIV infection, and drugs related such as fenfluramine, dexfenfluramine, et cetera, and schistosomiasis. Associated with significant venous and capillary involvement, and this group include pulmonary venoocclusive disease, which is extremely rare, pulmonary capillary heme angiomatosis, and persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. WHO group involves pulmonary hypertension that is caused by anything that has to do with the left heart failure, whether it is systolic dis, uh, failure, diastolic failure, mitral valve disease, such as this mitral stenosis, regurgitation. And WHO group, WHO group three is anything that has to do with hypoxia, whether it is caused by living at very high altitude or having uh, advanced chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, interstitial lung disease, or sleep apnea, et cetera. Group four is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Group five is further divided, it's miscellaneous basically, hematologic disorders such as chronic hemolytic anemia, myeloproliferative disorders, splenectomy, systemic disorders such as sarcoidosis, lymph angioleomyomatosis, pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis, neurofibromatosis, et cetera, metabolic disorders such as glycogen storage disease, gaucher disease, thyroid disorder, and others such as tumor obstruction and fibrosing mediastinitis, chronic renal failure, et cetera. Now the pathogenesis of pulmonary hypertension, it involves three things, vasoconstriction, a smooth muscle, cell and endothelial cell proliferation that leads to narrowing of pulmonary arterioles, lumen, and that narrowing leads to slow blood flow and that leads to thrombosis. This is the schematic presentation of pathogenesis of pulmonary hypertension. Three pathways involved include endothelial pathway, so stimulation of endothelial receptors will lead to vasoconstriction, proliferation of endothelial and smooth muscle cells, nitric oxide pathway, anything that impaired nitric oxide pathway will lead to decreased production of cyclic GMP, which is a potent vasodilator and inhibits proliferation of smooth muscles and endothelial cells. The other one is prostacyclin pathway, which is produced in endothelial cells, and it is a potent vasodilator and also inhibit smooth muscle and endothelial cell proliferation. Clinical features of pulmonary hypertension. Symptoms include, as in any other disease of 
lung, shortness of breath or dyspnea. In mild cases, patient will experience dyspnea only upon extreme exertion. As the disease progresses, then dyspnea will become more apparent on less and less physical activity. Fatigue, sometimes if this is fairly adverse, pulmonary arterial uh, pulmonary hypertension, it can present as syncope because in case of exertion, right ventricle will not be able to increase right ventricular cardiac output. It may present as a chest pain again because of increased pressure in the right ventricle as a result of increased pulmonary pressure and may present as an angina, hemoptysis. In the later stages when the right heart fails, then patient may present with sign of right heart failure such as elevated JVD, uh, abdominal distension due to SITs, peripheral edema, or there may be some symptoms of uh, disease associated with pulmonary hypertension, such as in case of SLE, Renox phenomena. Symptom physical uh, signs on physical examination, again, depends on the state of pulmonary hypertension. Initially, one would hear only loud P2, but as the disease advances, there may be right-sided S3, S4 related to right heart failure, uh, maybe pan-systolic murmur of tricuspid regurgitation, elevated JVD, abdominal distension due to SITs, and peripheral edema. Idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, also known as primary pulmonary hypertension, is of uh, two types, idiopathic and hereditary. Idiopathic means there is no cause is found, there is no family history. It is more common in females in younger age, 20 to 40, and bone morphogenic, morphogenetic protein receptor 2 will be positive in about 25% of cases, and diagnosis is made by exclusion. Hereditary, the bone morphogenetic protein receptor 2 will be positive in 80%. There will be family history. Now, pulmonary hypertension associated with connective tissue diseases. The two leading connective tissue diseases associated with pulmonary hypertension include scleroderma and SLE. Prevalence of pulmonary hypertension in scleroderma is 16%, and it's more common in limited scleroderma, which is known as Crest syndrome, and onset is usually after menopause. SLE, the prevalence is about 7%, more likely in women who have SLE with Renox phenomena and have anti-cardiolipin and antiphospholipid antibodies. Pulmonary arterial hypertension associated with congenital heart disease, any congenital heart disease that leads to left to right shunt that would lead to increased pulmonary blood flow that will eventually lead to in development of pulmonary hypertension. Portal pulmonary hypertension, it occurs in about 6% of patients with cirrhosis and portal hypertension. The development of pulmonary hypertension is, does not correlate with the severity of liver disease. Histologically, it is indistinguishable from idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. It does not respond to liver transplantation. In fact, liver transplantation is a considered to be a contraindication by many centers. Treatment is same as for idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension with HIV in about 0.5% of cases, and this one also hemodynamically and histologically similar to idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. Mechanism is not clear, probably caused by virus or viral DNA yeah, or um, The virus is usually absent in the uh, pulmonary capillaries. Chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. By definition, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension means the persistence of elevated pulmonary pressure three months of uh, effective anticoagulation following uh, acute pulmonary embolism. It develops in about two to 4% of cases due to 
incomplete resolution of pulmonary embolism that leads to increased resistance to blood flow and is likely to develop in patients who had elevated peer pressure more 50 or more at the time of PE and in case of submassive, massive, and recurrent PE. Pulmonary hypertension associated with drugs and toxins. Um, in the past, it, the drugs that were associated with it include uh, weight reducing medications such as fenfluramine, dexfenfluramine, and uh, some other drugs, likely amphetamine, methamphetamine and some chemotherapeutic agents such as carmestin, mitomycin, and dastinib. Question, incidence of pulmonary hypertension in obstructive sleep apnea best correlate with which of the following? Severity of apnea and hypopnea index, or is it severity of hypoxia, severity of obesity, or severity of hypoxia and obesity? So prevalence of pulmonary hypertension in case of sleep apnea is about 20%, and a stimulus for the development of pulmonary hypertension is hypoxia, because hypoxia leads to ways of constriction in pulmonary circulation. And it is the body mass index and degree of desaturation that correlate with pulmonary hypertension. It is not the severity of AHI. In general, Patient with uh, obstructive sleep apnea and pulmonary hypertension tends to be older, heavier, and have worse lung function when compared to patient with, with obstructive sleep apnea and without pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension associated with lung disease, again, due to hypoxia. And the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension in patients with COPD and ILD is more strongly associated, associated with hypoxia rather than symptom. And it is not expected unless the FEV1 is less than 50%. And uh, typically it's mild to moderate, but it would, but it's not uncommon if severe hypercapnia is present. And pulmonary hypertension tend to be moderate to severe in case of uh, restrictive lung disease and does not develop until the total lung capacity is less than 50%. Pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, extremely rare disease. The prevalence is 0.1 to 0.2 cases per million per person in general population. In fact, I had one, person, one patient with pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. Age at diagnosis can range from as young as eight weeks to as old as seven decades. As prevalence in male and female is pretty much one-to-one -one ratio. Pathologic hallmark is extensive and diffuse occlusion of pulmonary venules by fibrosis. Etiology is not clear, but maybe toxic exposure. In fact, my patient received uh, mitomycin and later on he developed pulmonary venoclusive disease associated pulmonary hypertension. Diagnostic workup for pulmonary arterial hypertension. The first screening test, if you suspect patient has pulmonary hypertension is to do the echocardiogram. And then you have, and if the echocardiogram confirm elevated pulmonary arterial pressure, then you have to do further testing to find out what is the cause of pulmonary hypertension? And that may include chest X-ray pulmonary function test. So this is the uh, schematic presentation of um, pulmonary hypertension caused by pulmonary arterial disease versus pulmonary venous hypertension. And the picture on the right side, there is four view chamber of the heart, and one can see there is enlargement of right ventricle, and right ventricle normally should be smaller than left ventricle, and there is also enlargement of right atrium, pushing the uh, intra, uh, interarterial septum to the left. On the left side is the left heart failure, which is causing secondary pulmonary hypertension, and one can see the left ventricle is enlarged and the left atrium is enlarged. So the first thing, as I said, is echocardiogram. And if the echocardiogram 
gram shows elevated pulmonary pressure, then second thing is to look at the left atrial size. If the left atrial size is enlarged, then it has to do something with the left heart. So that means the patient would belong to WHO class two. In fact, the two most common causes of pulmonary hypertension are left heart failure and pulmonary diseases. So let's see the echocardiogram showed elevated pressure, but left atrial size is normal. So now we are not dealing with WHO class two. That means we're not dealing with anything that has to do with the left heart. The next step now will be to do a chest X-ray to see if the patient has uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or interstitial lung disease and do um, pulmonary function tests for the same reason. If the chest X-ray does not show any COPD or interstitial lung disease and the pulmonary function test also does not indicate any interstitial lung disease or COPD, then you will move on to the next test. The finding in case of primary pulmonary hypertension on PFD would be isolated decrease in diffusing lung capacity. So if the chest X-ray is normal, and uh, so then you will do to make sure that patient does not have hypoxemia at nighttime during sleep. So patient needs to have sleep study to rule out sleep apnea, or at least should have continuous pulse oximetry monitoring overnight. If that doesn't show any desaturation, then you do not have to do sleep study. Let's say you did the sleep study and that also did not show any uh, sleep apnea. So now you have ruled out WHO class three as well. So now you're moving on to rule out the possibility of chronic thrombombolic pulmonary hypertension. For that, you, the diagnostic test is VQ scan if the chest X-ray is normal. As you can see in this ventilation perfusion scan, the top one is perfusion and the second row is ventilation and then perfusion and the last one is ventilation again. So the VQ scan will show low bar and or segmental perfusion defect. As you can see, uh, the first one here and the lower half of the left lung, there is no perfusion, but the ventilation is there. And as you can see every picture, there is mismatch defect and that's diagnostic of pulmonary embolism. Now, once the VQ scan is abnormal, the next test would to do is CT angiography to confirm and to assess the extent of pulmonary embolism as well as to establish uh, the chronic nature of pulmonary, uh, pulmonary embolism. So CT findings in case of chronic pulmonary embolism will include these one, which are shown in the picture. Thrombus usually will be eccentric. It may have some time um, calcification in it. It may be present in the form of a web and um, pulmonary parenchyma will show mosaic appearance and there will be enlarged bronchial arteries. Now let's see, you have done the CT, uh, VQ scan was normal, so you ruled out chronic thrombolic pulmonary hypertension as well. So now you're moving on to rule out other causes such as primary pulmonary hypertension or connective tissue disease related pulmonary hypertension. And this you will finally have to do the right heart catheterization to confirm the presence of pulmonary hypertension to assess its severity and to make sure it is not related to left heart failure. That means pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is less than 15. So the finding in case of uh, right heart catheterization will, inc will include mean pulmonary arterial pressure 25 or above at rest and pulmonary capillary wet pressure or pulmonary arterial pressure, 15 or less, and uh, pulmonary vascular resistance more than three 
uh, words units. And at the same time, when you are doing the right heart catheterization and you have confirmed that this patient has pulmonary hypertension, then you have to do a vasodilator challenge test, especially in case of primary pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary hypertension associated with drugs. This is the tracing of the patient who has pulmonary arterial hypertension, and you can see the pressures are high. This is PA pressures. So once you have diagnosed, now how are you going to manage this patient? Well, management depends on two things, functional class and whether this patient is a vasodilator responder or non-responder. And you use general major as well as use specific uh, medications for pulmonary arterial hypertension. General majors include if a patient is hypoxic, give them oxygen, peripheral edema, plus minus diuretic, digoxin, and anticoagulation. Responders. So responders are defined as when you give them acute vasodilator challenge test with the drugs such as nitric oxide or prostenoids or uh, adenosine, then they will if there is a decrease in the mean pulmonary arterial pressure of 10 or more and the total pressure is less than 40, that means this patient is going to respond to calcium channel blockers. So functional class is divided into four. If the patient with pulmonary hypertension but without any resulting limitation of ordinary physical activity, he's in functional class one. If patient is symptomatic with ordinary activity, functional class two. If he's symptomatic with less than ordinary activity, then three. And if he's symptomatic even at rest, that it's a functional class four. So high risk factors. If the patient has pulmonary hypertension and has syncope is a high risk. If he's in functional class four is a high risk. If he can't walk more than three meters on six minute walk test is a high risk. Or the echocardiogram shows pericardial effusion, that's a high risk. Or tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion is less than 1.5, that's also high risk and cardiac index two or less. Prognostic markers, Elevated right atrial pressure, more than 10, pericardial effusions, BNP level elevated, troponin level, uric acid. So what's your treatment goal? Treatment goal should be get this patient walk more than 300, at least three, more than 380 meters, and um, keep them in functional class one or two. BNP, normalize the BNP levels, echocardiogram, normalize their right ventricle size and function if you can with the use of medication and hemodynamics keep their right atrial pressure less than eight and cardiac index more than 2.5. So anticoagulation it has to be used in case of uh, pulmonary hypertension associated with chronic thromboembolic disease and also is a weak recommendation to be for it to be used in case of uh, area, um, primary, pulmonary, primary pulmonary hypertension. Now, medications that you are going to use are going to target the same pathways involved in the pathogenesis of pulmonary hypertension. That means endothelial pathway, nitric oxide pathway, and prostacyclin pathway. So specific drugs include endothelial receptor antagonist, nitric oxide pathway, and uh, which include nitric oxide, phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors, soluble vinylate cyclase stimulators such as rheocygate and prostenoids. Endothelian pathway drugs means the drugs that block the endothelian receptors are bosentin, embrisentin, and mesitentin. Nitric oxide pathway, it's a 
schematic presentation where you can uh, different drugs act on different steps. Like the main thing is nitric oxide pathway is that nitric oxide leads to increased cyclic GMP. So enzyme that stimulate that lead to increased production of cyclic GMP is uninate cyclase. So if a drug that stimulate this enzyme is rheocygate and cyclic GMP is broken down by phosphodiesterase type 5. So if you use phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, it will lead to increased level of cyclic GMP and cyclic GMP has vasodilated effect and inhibit smooth muscle and endothelial cell proliferation. The drugs which are PD-5 inhibitors include sildenafil and tadalafil. Prostacycline pathways drugs include epiprostinol, which is flolan, teprostinol, remodulin, iloprost, ventavis, and selexipac of trevi, which is oral. And the first two are given by IV infusion, Teprostinol is also given by a continuous subcutaneous infusion, and iloprost or ventavis given by inhalation. So, if the patient is a vasodilator responder, that means he responded to acute vasodilator challenge test, then you are going to treat all of these patients except functional class four. That means functional class one, two, three with calcium channel blocker. The problem with calcium channel blocker is that their response is not, effectiveness is not sustained. So you have to monitor this patient closely to make sure these patients continue to respond to calcium channel blocker and periodically do echocardiogram to make sure pulmonary pressure will not rise further. Then, if the patient is a non-vasodilator responder, then all of these patients should be treated with drugs those are specific for the treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension, except functional class one, the one who is asymptomatic but does have elevated pressure. For those patients, you use only general measures. Now, Functional class two or three, but not at high risk. That means that uh, they don't have uh, pericardial effusion. They do not present with uh, syncope, things like that. So for these patients, one needs to start them upfront combination therapy with endothelial receptor antagonist and PD-5 inhibitor. These are relatively recent uh, recommendation. In the past, they used to start one medication and then sequentially add another one if the patient does not respond to the first one. And generally, the recommendation is to start embrisentin and tadalafil. And this recommendation came from Therapy for Pulmonary Arterial Hypertension in Adults, Update of the Chest Guidelines Experts Panel Report 2019. Now, non responders, but functional class three, but at high risk. That means these are the patient who are likely to deteriorate quicker. These patients should be started on parenteral prostenoids, either flolane or traprostinol. And these are given by continuous IV infusion. So one has to place a Hickman catheter or permanent catheter and patient has to learn how to start himself or herself on continuous infusion. Flowland generally have to be replaced every 24 hours while the remodulin can be uh, filled every 48 hours. Now responders or non-responders, if they are in functional class four, they have to be treated with parenteral prostinoids, either epiprostinol or, traprost or traprostinol. What about pulmonary hypertension associated with chronic thrombolytic disease? Well, the treatment of choice for chronic thrombolytic related pulmonary hypertension is 
pulmonary and arterectomy, you have to remove the clot and anticoagulation. If for some reason, pulmonary thumbo and arterectomy cannot be done, then anticoagulation and start patients on drugs, those are specific for primary pulmonary hypertension, such as endothelium receptor antagonist or um, drugs those act through the nitric oxide pathway, especially the side gate. Now, perioperative care for this patient, uh, major preoperative complication occurs in about 6% of cases, and overall mortality is about 3.5%. So avoid general anesthesia if possible in these patients who have severe pulmonary arterial hypertension, evaluate and treat for decompensated right heart failure, and uh, in patients with severe pulmonary arterial hypertension or those who are on prostacycline, perform preoperative right heart cath and optimize their hemodynamics prior to elective surgery. Critically ill patients, uh, they should have swan gans catheter placed, and if they are hypotensive, place them on blood pressure that, such as dobutamine or neosinephrine, uh, to keep their systolic blood pressure more than 90, optimize their CVP, transfuse the blood of hemoglobin to keep the hemoglobin more than 10, and continue them whatever they were on for pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, consider nitric inhale nitric oxide, especially if the patient is intubated. Surgical treatment. In case of Functional class four, these patients actually should be referred to centers. Those are specialized for the management of pulmonary arterial hypertension. And if patients continue to get worse, they need lung transplant or heart lung transplant. And uh, sometimes you can use atri atrial septostomy as a bridging to decompensate the elevated right sided pressure. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, please contact me at wasim.wasim077 at gmail.com. Have a good day.